Hello all, before we begin this episode, I would just like to ask our listeners to like and subscribe to this channel as it will help us out. We are fairly new on YouTube and it would help us a lot if you did so. You can also comment if you prefer. Thank you. Welcome in the Great Khan's Tent. History, Literature and Storytelling in the Great Khan's Tent is now available on YouTube. You can find us using this podcast name. Fear not, listeners, episodes will still be released on this podcast first, and it is only after a delay of a week that I will upload them onto YouTube. You can still find us on all your podcast providers first. Are you interested in getting the book you just published reviewed? Writing some piece of literature and need help getting it out there and promoted? Interested in sharing what piece of literature we should cover next? Well, fret not. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Patreon, where your contribution can help in growing this podcast. For as low as $3 a month, a price less than a good, and I mean good, cup of coffee, you can help contribute to the growth of this podcast. Every bit helps, but as always, it is not necessary to do so, but will be appreciated. Find the Patreon link on our website, on our social media accounts, or email us and we can send it to you. Thank you. In this series, you may hear a sound in the middle of the narration like this. This is just a little informative sound to let you, the listener, know that an important footnote will be provided to help in the understanding of a certain concept or expand on what was discussed. If you have any suggestions, comments, or complaints, please be sure to email us at all lowercase in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. That is in the great Hans tent at gmail.com. We would love to hear from our listeners. Thank you for listening, and now, on with the show. In this episode of In the Great Khan's Tent Presents The Later Mughals, we continue with the struggles of the three sons of Aurangzeb, this time focusing on the two strongest candidates, Bahadur Shah and Azam Shah, and the beginning of the culmination of this conflict with the start of the Battle of Jaju, on the 20th of June 1707 CE. Azam Shah's struggle with the loyalty of some of his prominent supporters and their own competing interests begin to be more clearer in this episode with the culmination of actions taken by two prominent supporters, Zulfikar Khan and Raja Jai Singh Kachwa, and how it affected the struggle at Jaju. As in the last episode, Azam Shah's own personality faults are a result of Aurangzeb's own suspicious nature and plays a role in how he reacted to the ongoing developments. Section 4. Prince Muhammad Azim, second son of Muhammad Moazim, reaches Agra. As we have already stated, Alamgir, a short time before his death, influenced by suspicion instilled into him by Azam, Shah recalled his grandson Muhammad Azim from the government of the province of Bihar. In compliance with this order, the prince took with him treasure remitting from Bengal and started from Azimabad Patna, intending apparently to make his way to the Dakkan through Agra. The more direct road was possibly unsafe, as any rate it was seldom used by the Mohammedan generals, who usually went from Hindustan to the Dakkan, either from Agra through Gwalior or from Delhi through Ajmer. The prince was at Shezadpur Sarkar Kora in the Ganges Jamuna Duab when he heard of his grandfather's death. By the advice of Aga Muhammad Sayyid Baz Khan, brother of the Lair Khan and others, he enlisted more troops and advanced as quickly as possible in the direction of Agra 
at the head of more than 20,000 horse. At Itawa, Kher Andesh Khan presented himself with treasure and artillery. Muhammad Azim called upon Mukhtar Khan, the Subedar of Agra, to come out of the city and present himself. Mukhtar Khan, being father-in-law to Bidar Bakht, Azim Shah's eldest son, was naturally a strong partisan of the opposite party. The only hostile step, however, that he took was to prevent a bridge being thrown across the Jamuna, but the river being fordable in many places, this did not avail him anything, and Muhammad Azim, with his army and baggage, crossed in safety. After this feeble defense, Mukhtar Khan lost his presence of mind and became afraid to do anything. The prince sent Baaz Khan and other officers into the city to arrest him, at the same time confiscating all his treasures, elephants, horses, and goods. In the end, Mukhtar Khan came over to Bahadur Shah's side and was presented through Baaz Khan. Baki Khan Kul, commandant of the Agra fort, was also summoned to surrender. To open the gates of the fort and to make over its contents to the men deputed for that purpose. Baki Khan, who like Mukhtar Khan was favorable to Azam Shah, invented the excuse that the rival claimant had not yet arrived in person and until this happened he could not make over the fort to anyone. Moreover, up to this time, the prospects of Azim Shah were calmly held to be far better than those of his brother, Muhammad Muazim. Baki Khan's refusal incensed Prince Muhammad Azim, who erected batteries in the grove lying below the mansion known as Dar al Shikos, on top of the Jama Masjid and over the triple gate. Tripolia of the city, intending to frighten the garrison by a cannonade and the discharge of rockets. On his side, Baki Khan pointed his guns and posted his musket men ready for resistance. His first shot struck the three domed building in the marketplace, Chalk, and destroyed its domes. The second killed many men and fell on the gate of the mosque. The third reached the mansion of Dara Shako and knocked down a wall in one of its rooms. Several of Muhammad Azim's men were killed and he then desisted from any further attack on the fort. A truce of 20 days was agreed on and Muhammad Azim's awaited his father's arrival, his force having swollen now to 40,000 men. Bidar Bakht advances to the Chumbal. Prince Muhammad Azim, as already stated, immediately on entering Agra, sent forward a body of troops under Muhtasim Khan to protect the fords on the Chumbul River, 40 miles south of that place. After reaching Dolpur, Muhtasim Khan established batteries on the riverbank on the north side of the stream and prepared to fight. He also called upon Jan Nisar Khan, Khwaja, Muharram, Bahadur Shai, the Fajdar of Gwalior, to march and join him. At this time, Bidar Bakht had advanced beyond Gwalior and was one march from the Chumbal. His camp was fixed at Nurabad. Bidar Bakht When Bidar Bakht was encamped at Palacha, six coasts from Narwar, Zulfikar Khan and his reinforcements had come up with him. Nurabad, 19 miles north of Gwalior and 20 miles south of the Chumbal, now resolved to cross the Chumbal and attack Muhtasim Khan. Zulfikar Khan, a more experienced soldier, was opposed to this course. The resulting quarrel between the prince and his chief general is told in the most lively fashion in the pages of Iradat Khan. The trivial causes from which such disputes arise, the way in which mere suspicion is fanned into certainty by crafty advisers, the great man's petulance and childishness, the sudden changes of temper, all is painted to the weary life. 
In the end, Bedar Bacht obtained his own way and crossed the river by the ford through unguarded passages. Upon this, Mutashim Khan and his troops abandoned the artillery and fled during the night to Agra, glad to save their lives. The movement having succeeded, Zufakar Khan made his peace and was received again into favor. Bidar Bakht would have liked to push on to Agra, but formal orders were now received to halt at Dolpur until Azim could arrive there in person, when he would distribute the commands and arrange the various stations to be taken by the different bodies of troops. We must now leave Azim Shah and turn to the movements of his elder brother, Muhammad Muazim. Section 5 the advance of Muhammad Muazzam to Lahore, Delhi, and Agra. It was at Jamrud, 12 miles west of Peshawar, that Muhammad Muazzam heard of his father's death. The date was the 22nd March, 1707, only 20 days after the event an instance of the speed with which intelligence could be carried, the distance from Ahmednagar to Jamrud being about 1,400 miles, and the average distance travelled by the messengers being thus 70 miles a day. It was now a race between competitors for the throne. Whoever could first reach Agra or Delhi and obtain the wealth stored at one or both cities, would be almost certain to overpower his rival. In such an emergency, the usual dilatory movements of an Indian army would be useless. We have seen with what haste Azam advanced from the Dakkan. Muhammad Muazim was now to display equal if not greater activity. The distance to be travelled were from Ahmednagar to Agra about 700 miles, from Jamrud to Agra about 715 miles. The general opinion was that all the chances were in favor of Azam Shah arriving first and winning the prize. During the last year of his father's lifetime, Muhammad Muazim, in whom there must have been great power of dissimulation, had given out that if Azam Shah claimed the throne, he would make no attempt to contend with him, but would at once seek a refuge in Persian territory or elsewhere. But the truth was that he had made secret preparations in concert with Munim Khan, Diwan of Kabul, to assert his claims without a moment's delay. Munim Khan had secured the prince's confidence and had on his recommendation been made Naib Subadar of Lahore. Here he worked busily to collect the means of war and for a year had been in the field with an army beyond the Bias and even the Sutlaj. On the pretext of a rebellion by Inayat Khan and other robbers Amidars, of the Jalandhar, Dauba and Kasba of Talwan. Mr. Irvine had read the word as Malun and left a query, Malot of Ain. On referring to the Persian text, I adopted the reading Talwan, J. Sarkar. Camels, oxen to drag the cannons and other means of transport with boats for making bridges across the rivers had been silently collected in readiness in the country beyond Lahore and Peshawar. Rao Bud Singh, Hada of Bundi and Baijai Singh, Kutch Waha, who had taken refuge with Bahadur Shah at Kabul, were reconciled and through them there were enlisted a large number of Rajputs who joined the standard just about the time of Alamgir's death. Everything was ready, the signal only was awaited. On the 31st March 1707, Muhammad Muazim reached Peshawar with his two youngest sons, Rafi ul Qadar and Khojista Akhtar. A congratulatory letter was received from Munim Khan, governor of Lahore. Orders were issued to the prince's eldest son, Muizuddin, Subedar of Tata and Multan, to join at Lahore 
with his eldest son, Azuddin. Other leading men were also summoned. The march was resumed after one day, and Indus was crossed by means of the boats collected by Munim Khan, a bridge which usually was made in two months being put together in two days. On reaching Puli Shah Dala, twelve coasts north of Lahore, Muhammad Muazim celebrated his ascension and took the title Bahadur Shah, by which name henceforth we will refer to him. Homage was paid by all the lords and great officials of the Punjab, headed by Munim Khan. On the first Safar, 1119, after Hijra, 3rd May 1707, crossing the Ravi by a bridge, Bahadur Shah entered Lahore, visiting there the tomb of the saint, Sheikh Abdul Hassan, and the home of Shah Ramzi, a holy man. Muizuddin, the prince's eldest son, had now arrived from Multan, and Bahadur Shah with his three sons, Muizuddin, Rafi ul Qadr, and Khajista Akhtar, rested in the garden of Shalimar, which is situated four miles from Lahore on the road to Amritsar. The interval was devoted to, to preparing a new coinage, the inspection of the treasure and stores in the fort at Lahore and the conferring of increased rank on the princes and the chief leaders. Munim Khan there received the new title of Khan Zaman, a set of drums, and the promise of being appointed wazir. Taking 28 lakhs of rupee with him, Bahadur Shah left Lahore on the 5th May 1707. At Sarhind, the Fajdar, Wazir Khan, contributed 8 lakhs from the revenue, that he had collected. On the way, much munition of war was brought into Khanazad Khan, the son of Munim by Mirza Asadullah, Fajdar of Sonipat. Delhi was reached on the 1st June 1707. Munim Khan, preceding the army and accompanied by Sayyid Ajmad Khan, Bu Ali, then Bakshi and Waqia Negar of Delhi had an interview with Muhammad Yar Khan, the Subadar of Delhi, who sent back his son Hassan Yar Khan with the keys of the fort and the usual offerings in token of submission. On entering the city, shrines were visited and alms distributed. A sum of 30 lakhs of rupees was taken from the treasure house in the fort, and after visits to the shrine of Khaja Kutubuddin, and of Nizamuddin Alia, surnamed Sultan ul Mashaykh, on the 3rd June, the journey was resumed. On the 12th June, the day that Azam Shah reached Gwalior, Bahadur Shah arrived near Agra. He was met by Mukhtar Khan, the late Subadar, Jan Nisar Khan, Fajdar of Gwalior, and other officials of the province. Baki Khan Kul, commandant of the Agra fort, also sent a letter of submission with the keys of the fortress, stating that if Munim Khan would come alone, he would make over the place to him. Accordingly, Munim Khan entered by a narrow plank, placed over the deep ditch and leading to a wicket gate. After a short rest, he sealed up the treasury and posted his own men at the gates. The emperor's camp was pitched close to Bahadur Ara. It is at Poya Gut, close to Sultan Ganj. There seems to be two baths at Agra with somewhat familiar names, Bagh Dara and Bagh Dara Ara. The former is also called Nur Manzil and possesses a large well which is the only thing now left. It is called the Well of the 52 Water Bags, Bavan Log Kikuan. The site is three miles south of the fort. It is now within the cantonments and is called Khawaspura. Mirza Wikar Ali Beg's letter of 20th February 1893. The name of Nur Manzil was given it with reference to the Emperor Jahangir's name, Nuruddin Muhammad. It is said, in spite of Alamgir's costly campaigns in the Dakin, 
which lasted for the last 25 years of his reign, 24 crores, or as some say, 13 crores gold and silver, coined and uncoined, collected during the four previous reigns, were found stored in the fort at Agra. Four crores were brought out, and this sum, two crores, were distributed at once. Three lakhs to each of the three princes with the emperor, three lakhs to Munim Khan and his sons, one lakh to Barha Saeeds, one lakh to Agar Khan and his moles. On the same scale, all those who had journeyed received their shares. Munim Khan's titles were again increased and the divisions of the army were set in order. Bahadur Shah's letter to Azam Shah and the latter's reply. From Mathura, while on his way from Delhi to Agra, Bahadur Shah sent to Azam Shah a letter by the hand of a holy man, Mir Abdul Ul Karim, the patch wearer. He reminded his brother that their father had made a division of the empire, allotting to him as second son the four provinces of the Dakin. If this did not content him, he might take Gujarat and Ajmer in addition. In this way, they would avoid the sin of spilling the blood of Allah's creatures. Some say that Bahadur Shah added that if this offer was not accepted, he was willing to meet his brother in single combat and leave it for the sword to decide. These proposals only served to further incense Azam Shah against the Banya, his favorite nickname for his elder brother. His answer was that a kingdom was not a thing which could be divided like an inheritance. His brother, although a learned and well-read man, seemed to have forgotten the verses in Sheikh Saadi Shirazi's Gulistan, which every schoolboy knows. Ten poor men can sleep comfortably under one blanket, while two kings cannot be contained within one kingdom. How could two swords be kept in one scabbard? Further, if a division was to be made, it should be an equal one. Was it fair to offer him four provinces while Bahadur Shah kept fourteen for himself? Some assert that the only division he would accept was, as he said, that given in the lines, Arz farsh e khana da balab e bam az an iman. Az bam e khana da ba sariya az ain e tu. My share is from the floor to the roof of the house, yours from the roof up to the firmament. He ended by reciting in a loud voice with arms stretched forth and sleeves rolled up the line from the Shahnama. When tomorrow's sun has risen, there we will be, I and my mace, the battlefield, and Afra Sayyib. Section 6. The Battle of Jaju Finding hostilities could not be avoided, and that Azam Shah was already at Gwalior, Bahadur Shah determined to advance and give battle at Dalpur, 34 miles south of Agra. He left Bagh Dahar Ara on the 14th June 1707, and an advanced guard of about 80,000 horsemen was sent forward under the command of Prince Muhammad Azim Aghar Khan, Khan Azad Khan, son of Munim Khan, and Saf Shikan Khan, general of the artillery. Of these troops, 30,000 were raised and paid for by Muhammad Azim, who had brought with him a large sum of money from Bengal, some say as much as 9 to 11 crores of rupees. This advanced force was ordered to take possession of the fords and ferries on the Chumbal, which is only one mile beyond and to the south of Dalpur. On his side, Azam Shah, as soon as he had learnt that Bahadur Shah was at Agra, left the rest of his heavy baggage in the fort at Gwalior in charge of Asad Khan, the vizier, 
Inayatullah Khan, Divan of the Khalsa, and others. His sister Zinat un Nisa, the ladies belonging to the family of Alamgir, and the wives of many nobles were left at the same place. A few members of his harem, with a few jewels and some gold coins, continued with the army. Azam Shah crossed the Chambal by the Kamthra crossing. The ford is named Kane Thiri in Indian Atlas, sheet 50, southeast, and stands six miles south of Dolapur, Jaisarkar, and made for Dalpuram. A little money was paid to the troops while Bidar Bakht, the eldest son, was appointed to command a vanguard. With him were Zulfikar Khan, Khan Alam Dakani, and Munawar Khan, sons of Khan Zaman Hyderabadi, Rao Dalpat Bundela, Ram Singh Hada, and Raja Jai Singh Kachwaha. In support of the van followed a body of troops under the second son, Prince Walaja. With him were Mirza Sadar Uddin Muhammad Khan, Tarbiyat Khan, Amanullah Khan, and Mutalib Khan, Salabat Khan, Sultan Nazar, Akil Khan, Sheikh Sultan, Safawi Khan Bakshi, Sayyid Shujat Khan, Ibrahim Beg Tabrizi, and Usman Khan. There were with about 25,000 horsemen. When Azam Shah near Dalpur, his son Bidar Bakht came out two coasts from camp to meet and escort him. For a moment, parental love overcame his jealousy and Azam Shah received his son cordially, conferring on him valuable gifts. Here the Bakshis made their report after the troops had been mustered. The numbers were 65,000 horsemen and 45,000 infantry armed with matchlocks. In this enumeration were included the troops serving directly under Azam Shah and his sons, as well as those brought by the nobles and other leaders. Upon starting, all pay had been raised one-fourth, and the prince now promised that upon the day they entered Agra, another increase of one-fourth on the total pay would be granted. The whole force was divided into a vanguard, right and left wings, and a center commanded, respectively, by Bidar Bakht, Azam Shah himself, Walaja, and Ali Tabar. There were not many large cannons or mortars, these having been left behind at Ahmadagar, Aurangabad, and Burhanpur, or wherever they fell. The rest were left at Gwalior, as the enemy were supposed to be deficient in such artillery. There were, however, a number of smaller pieces known as the Rakhla Shatarnal Camry guns and Gajnal's elephant guns. The new head of the artillery, Padshah Kulli Khan, with the help of Hazrat Kulli Beg Sistani, distributed these equally to each division of the army. Azim Shah, in the boastful manner usual with him, had replied to a demand by the artillery commander for orders that he had no use for cannons against a cattle breeder, nor need to draw his sword. A staff would suffice to break his head. He was also of opinion that an artillery fight was a stripling's pastime and that the only real weapon was the sword. It was decided to march for Samugar, ten miles southeast of Agra, it being considered a happy omen to select the ground on which Alamgir had triumphed over his brother Daro Shako fifty-two years before. On the 17th of June, 1707, Azam Shah completed his march without seeing the enemy. From want of water, the sufferings of the troops had been very great. On the way, no wells or ponds were met with, and the only water to be got was that from a ravine, and it was very brackish. This is probably the Nalla near the Mania railway station, marked on the map as flowing halfway between Dalpur and Jaju. The nobles and great men suffered less for they had taken, in their routine, bottles and ox skins full of sweet water, with which they quenched their own thirst and that of their relations. 
With these exceptions, the men of the army toiled along with their tongues lolling out of their mouths from thirst, while any animal or man that drank a drop of the brackish water suffered greatly. Many died from thirst. When we think of the heat of the month of June in the neighborhood of Agra, it is easy to believe that in this account there is no exaggeration. Owing to the intelligence which reached him of Azam Shah's movement, Bahadur Shah ordered his advance tents to be sent forward and pitched in a grove four miles north of Jaju. The movements of the rivals before the battle are thus described by Bimsen, who was present in Azam's army and was wounded in the company of his master, Dalpat Rao Bandela. On the 15th Rabil Aval, Bahadur Shah from the garden of Dahra near Agra set out to punish Muhammad Azam Shah and leaving Jaju on his left hand set up his royal tents and engaged in marshalling his forces. He filled with artillery the uneven pass Guzar of Jaju. Muhammad Alam Shah having reached Nurabad on the 14th halted for one day under the guidance of the Zamidars. He left Jaju on his left hand and on the 17th arranging his troops marched out to battle. At this time Shah Alam learnt that Azam had arrived at a distance of two coasts from Jaju and had plundered the imperial advance tents which had been pitched close to the garden of Jaju and that Prince Azim Ushan had hurriedly formed line of battle to oppose him. The following are the details of the incident. When the army of Azam Shah arrived two coasts from Jaju, they sighted the tents and standards of the camp of Bahadur Shah. The left wing under Zulfikar Khan charged at the gallop. The defender Rustam Dil Khan fled and the men of Azam engaged in plunder. There are two serious mistakes here. 1. Shah Alam's advanced tents could not have been pitched close to Jaju and four miles from that village at the same time, and two, that emperor in marching south from Agra must have left Jaju on his right and not his left. The battlefield was clearly four miles southeast of Jaju. J. Sarkar Rustum Dil Khan, Mir Tuzuk, was in charge, and Prince Muhammad Azim was not far off, protecting the new camp. On the 18th June 1707, Bahadur Shah, following the advice of his astrologers, fixed on the 20th as a fortunate day on which to give battle. He and his three sons set out in the morning from their old camp and entered a royal hunting preserve, which was near their route, intending to pass the day in hunting. Valentine Page 276 gives Shah Alam's number as 152,000 horse and 178,000 foot, and he adds a long list of the commanders under 89 headings, but most of the names are so disguised as to be unrecognizable. The list shows a total of 170,000 cavalry, 195,000 infantry, 4,414 cannon, 62 elephants, 1,500 camels, and 3,000 oxen. The same morning, Bidar Bakht was marching northward from Jaju on his way to Samugar. The soldiers, owing to the heat and the scarcity of water, were, as a native writer says, melting like wax in the jungle. They were unable to bear the weight of their chainmail and steel breastplates. These they placed on the powder wagons, portal, and marched with nothing on but their long cotton coats. The head of the skirmishers, Karawal Begi, had that day selected a line of march through thick underwood for the reasons that on the way would be found a large well with steps. Luckily this well was found. A number of the bodyguard, Jalu Khas, stayed behind to drink but the effects of the salt water of the previous march were so great that their tongues still hung out of their mouths and they were still eager for more water. In this way they proceeded for 15 or 16 miles.
Bidar Bakht on this day was mounted on a war elephant, his quiver at his back and his bow on his arm. His chief men surrounded him. Zulfikar Khan followed on the left with Ram Singh Hada and Rao Dalpat Bundela, two men long in his employ, and his trusty friend Aman Ullah Khan, who, though separate, appeared as if he were part of Zulfikar Khan's corps. With the advance guard of the center, Il Timish, marched Aziz Khan Afghan, while still further in advance were Khan Alam Dakhani and his brother Munawar Khan. On the right was Prince Wala Jah with Aman Ullah Khan, Abdullah Khan, servant of Azam Shah. The center followed under the direct command of Azam Shah, around whom were gathered Tarbiyat Khan, Mutalib Khan, Khudabanda Khan, Hamidullah Khan, Bahadur, Amir Khan, and others. In this way they drew near to Jaju without learning the exact position of Bahadur Shah or the direction of his advance. Bidar Bakh continued his march till he reached a village below which flowed a streamlet of water and around which there were several wells. At this time his troops were scattered out of order and following what route they chose. It was proposed to rest here, Azam Shah with the main body being three miles behind, the position and intentions of the enemy unknown, the country in front waterless and the day likely to be very hot. Besides this the troops were scattered and Zulfikar Khan had gone off so far to the left as to be out of sight. Where Bidar Bakht was, there was sufficient water, a halt would give the artillery time to join, and the scattered troops to assemble. Moreover, should the enemy advance against them, he would have the advantage of retaining possession of the water. The prince approved of this advice and ordered Iradat Khan to inform Azam Shah accordingly. The report was made and Azam Shah sent word that he would follow. When Iradat Khan returned to the village, he was surprised to discover that Bidar Bakht had left it. On coming up with him, the drums were beating for a victory. Iradat Khan was unwilling to accept the good news. The prince turned to a scout and said, Tell Iradat Khan what you have seen. The man said that he had seen Shah Alam's own elephant, riderless, making off for Agra. Still Iradat Khan was unconvinced, but Bidar Bakht, as his only answer, said, you are forever a forbearer of evil. It seems that word had been brought to Prince Bidar Bakht that the enemy was in sight. What had been seen were the flags upon Bahadur Shah's advanced tents, then being erected under the superintendence of Rustam Dil Khan, Mir Tizuk. Prince Azim Ushan was at a little distance, ready to protect them from any attack. Khan Alam Dakani and Munawar Khan detached themselves from Bidar Bakht's left wing and made a descent upon the imperial tents in the plundering fashion copied from the Maharatas. They had only 2,000 to 3,000 men with them, but Muhammad Azam's men were taken by surprise and out of 20,000 to 30,000 horse, only 400 to 500 stood fast around that prince's elephant. In the confusion, Bahadur Shah's tent were set fire to, whereupon the Jats attached to Bahadur Shah's army and the soldiers on both sides began to plunder them. In this first attack, Rustam, Dil Khan, Mir Tuzuk to Bahadur Shah was cut off and making the best of it went and presented himself to Azam Shah and was allowed to ride in his retinue. Azim Ushan continued to face the enemy and held his ground so far as he was able, sending at the same time urgent messengers to his father calling for reinforcements. The messengers reached Bahadur Shah while he was still engaged in hunting, but he turned at once towards a field of battle, sending first Munim Khan, the wazir, and then Prince Muiz Uddin and his other sons to support Azim Ushan. Meanwhile, Bidar Bakht's drums began to beat in honor of his supposed victory. Zulfikar Khan and the others proposed to Azim Shah that they should encamp where they were and postpone the final battle till the next day, in the hope that the other side's defeat in the skirmish would exercise a depressing influence on them. Azim Shah would listen to no such proposal, styling it angrily mere women's talk. 
as the dust raised first by one and then by the other of the bodies of troops dispatched by Bahadur Shah was seen in the distance, Iradat Khan pointed to Bidar Bakht that their appearance betokened forces of at least 50,000 horse in each. By the prince's order, Iradat Khan rode off to inform Azam Shah. He found the prince some three miles in the rear, pushing through the crowd and in obedience to a signal alighting from his horse near the traveling throne, takht e rawan on which Azam Shah was seated, Iradat Khan made his report of the enemy's near approach. With furious looks and rolling eyes pulling up his sleeves, a gesture usually to him when angry, Azam Shah shouted, What enemy comes against me? He called for his war elephant, twirled frantically a crooked staff, and standing upright on his throne said, tauntingly, Be not afraid, I am coming to my son. By the time that Iradat Khan reached Bidar Bakht again, the cannonade had begun. The two advancing bodies of Bahadur Shah's troops had now halted within a rocket's flight of Bidar Bakht's line, one under the command of Prince Azim Ushan, the other under that of Munim Khan, the wazir supported by the princes Muizuddin and Jaha Shah. On Bidar Bakht's side, it was found impossible to rally all his men, many of whom had scattered to plunder the camp. Furthermore, his troops were hampered by the crowd of baggage elephants, cattle, and followers on both flanks and in the rear. The opponent's artillery played freely on them and did great execution. The musketry balls fell like hail and rockets placed in a line before the advancing troops were repeatedly discharged with effect. The sun was high in the heavens and the heat excessive. After a time, Bidar Bakht's men became impatient and made ready to charge headed by Khan Alam Dakhani and his bodyguard of 500 men arrayed like bridegrooms in long red coats and turbans of green and gold. As Khan Alam advanced, many men lagged behind and not more than 300 remained with him to the end of the charge. The chief drove his elephant sharply up alongside that ridden by Azim Ushan and three times aimed a blow at the prince with his spear, but the weapon missing the prince struck the thigh of Jalal Khan and an attendant seated behind him. The prince was unhurt and with an arrow hit his assailant full in the breast and killed him, as he was trying to jump into the prince's howdah. The prince's bodyguard closed in. Jalal Khan inflicted a wound on Munawar Khan, the brother of Khan Alam, and on the fall of the leader of the rest, their men were dispersed. By the retreat, the prince, Wala Jah, was left exposed. Seeing his danger, Amanullah Khan hastened to that prince's assistance, but a rocket which fell on his elephant's pad set it alight, causing the elephant to turn around and take flight. Amanullah Khan, partly burnt, fell to the ground, and his troops, believing he was dead, fled in disorder. Thereupon, Prince Walaja retreated for protection to Bidar Bakht. Baz Khan Afghan, a leader who had taken service with Azim Ushan, aided by Raja Bud Singh Hada, Raja Bahadur, the prince's maternal uncle, and Muhammad Rafi Khurasani, afterwards Sarab Buland Khan, now attacked Zulfikar Khan, but was repulsed with great loss. Baz Khan himself being badly wounded. In this attack, however, two of Zulfagar Khan's most trusted commanders, Ram Singh Hada of Bundi and Dalpat Rao Bundela of Deity Orcha, were killed by cannon shot, Rao Dalpat being struck by a ball from a swivel piece which entered at the chin and came out at his back. The fatal ball then passed into Bimson's arm and there was arrested in its course. The Rajputs lost heart and fled, taking with them the dead bodies of their chieftains. For a while Zulfikar Khan himself stood firm, but when assailed by the whole force of Azim Ushan's division, he made over the command to Sayyid Muzaffar and retired to the rear of Azim Shah's position. He left his elephant and fled on horseback to rejoin his father Asad Khan at Gwalior. He had received a slight wound on the lip. 
as to this wound, Yahya Khan in folio 113b says that Azam Shah when Zulfikar Khan proposed to put off the final contest to the next day, fired at him an arrow without a head, Tikka, which hit him on the lip and broke a tooth. Between Dalpur and Nurabad, his flight was hindered by the villagers who plundered his men, killing several officers of rank, such as Muzaffar with his sons and nephews, while Kabir Afghan, from the weight of his armor and the heat fell from his horse. Zulfikar Khan neither paused nor gave any heed, but pursued his way to Gwalior. His flight determined the defeat of the army. The author of the Masir ul Umrah accused him with some justice of having on this occasion sought more to preserve his own interests than to really exert himself for the prince whose side he had adopted. Nanishmand Khan's remark on Zofakar Khan's early flight from the battlefield are exceedingly pungent and must have stung him to the quick. Bimson, although serving under one of Zulfikar Khan's own officers, Rao Dalpat Bandela, takes the same view. If Nusra Jung, as required by his apparent loyalty, had joined actively with the other leaders in the attack, and had even for a little while held his own in the battle, all the difficulties that fell upon Azam Shah would never have happened. Another interval in the ranks was made by the departure of Raja Jai Singh Kachwaha from his place on Bidar Bakht's left. At the exact moment of the severest fighting, he put his bow into his howda, wrapped his shawl around his head, and made his way to Prince Muhammad Azim, by whom he and his father Bahadur Shah he was not very graciously received. Others, influenced by the bad example of Zulfikar Khan, also withdrew or relaxed their efforts. In the Great Khan's Tent is now available on Coffee. If you are interested in supporting this podcast, please click on the link available on our many social media platforms or email us. Why not donate to our Coffee to show your appreciation? Every bit helps, and we thank you for your continued support. We love that our listeners love listening to us. This episode has been written, edited, and produced by Saf Big. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a wonderful day and or night. And may the journeys on which you are set upon be fruitful. Thank you for listening.